Hey guys, so um, for those of you who never saw the Instagram post, uh, unfortunately there was a bit of a family tragedy, uh, not my immediate family with Vass or my parents, but uh, you know some, uh, some extended family, and I uh, just didn't feel right to record a new episode, obviously wasn't in the mood to do so, so um, instead of just leaving it for another week like we've done in the past, um, I kind of want to repost one of the first deep dives I ever did with uh, two of my friends, Jim and Hennick. And, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy. Obviously, the quality is a little bit different. Um, you know, I was testing it in a basement. and uh, But regardless, I think it was a really, really cool and good conversation. And the three of us were all really new to that format. So, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And thank you so much for understanding. We should be back next week uh, for the regular, uh, regular program. And, uh, yeah, just appreciate all your support. And now I give you deep dive number one on directors. The ensemble casting. That's like, that's what movies are, is like, yeah. Spotlight, The Big Short, like all these great, great movies that are coming out. The Post, like Streep and Hanks. It's like, it's all about three billboards. It, three billboards. It's all about the ensemble cast because people are getting smarter, I think, to an extent. Yeah, they're knowing what to pick. They're actually, yeah. It, it's, well, and I know this is for the movie side of it. And for those of you watching, this is the F we're doing uh, a roundtable. New show we're doing just for audio. And I'm here with Hennick. How you doing? And Jim. How you doing? And we, this is just us sitting down and just going crazy on all things movies. But we talked about restaurants. And people are getting smarter in restaurants. I think people are also getting smarter about their movies. Well, there is, there's, I think the younger generation is actually maturing faster. And because when I grew up, I didn't have the internet to really explore the world. Yeah. Whereas now people's expectations for what a movie does for them seems to be better and higher. And that therefore the writing and the directing has to execute on a bit of a higher level. So it's, I think it's, there's a bit of maturity there. Yeah. I also, but like, I also think uh, in the past, directors, movie makers, um, to an extent would pander to the to the audience. And I think superhero movies are a great example of that. Mm -hmm. um, but now more than ever, people understand how much power, or movie makers, directors understand the power that their audience has. Like, yeah. it's it's far more, we pander far more to the people and what they want. Well, and a lot of that is evident in when you look at the way uh, movies marketed. Marketing is a massive thing. You look at Deadpool. Deadpool was 50% marketing, 50% movie. 100%. And luckily the movie worked out. Um, I was talking to someone the other day in regards to um, embargoes. And embargoes are when reviews can be released. Right, right. People are wise to that. I'm more wise to it now than I was before. If, if a studio decides to only release the review the day the movie is out, they don't have faith in the project. Fair. What's your impact? What do you think a critic's impact is on your choice of a movie? I think this is a very big question that yeah, a lot of people... Uh, well, okay, let me put it this way. I scroll Netflix a lot. Yeah. And I'll see something that intrigues me. I might watch the preview potentially, but it'll intrigue me. I go right to IMDb. And I, I'm only because it's not... I don't let it justify whether I like the movie or not, but it will spark whether I invest the time to watch it or not. And that's my level of commitment to those reviews. So you rely on people's reviews over critic reviews? Because that's what I, I... I don't know. I, my, my general opinion on the, on the general public is they're, they're usually idiotic. So to say <laughs> that... But at the same time, I'm not a critic fan either when your job is to tear something apart. But that is their job and they're experts. So in saying that, I probably would go... If I didn't feel politics were involved, I would probably listen to a critic way over the general public. Okay. But a lot of people have the exact opposite opinion. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. My peers is what I what I determine yeah. uh, because they're regular people just like me. And and I want to take my advice from that And it works with regular taste, I guess. Yeah. Well, and, and for you, is that like, do you value the review of a critic um, or do you, like for you, it's, no critics. I'm going to go see this, and maybe I'll look at a critic's review after the fact. I'll never let a critic decide whether I'll go see a movie. Cool. Um, I will read critical reviews simply to get a feel of what the movie's what what I'm expecting. Because yeah. 
A lot of people are like, I just don't know what the movie is about. I want no expectations. Yep. I don't care about expectations. I usually set my own. But when I see critical reviews, there are specific critics that I'll I'll pay attention to. Yep. Um, but no, it doesn't impact my judgment of a film. It doesn't. I know Rotten Tomatoes has been doing that. A lot of people and and people misunderstand what Rotten Tomatoes is actually there for. It's an aggregate site. Right. So they pull the reviews there together, and I've mentioned it a bunch of times just in our other shows and stuff. It's not it shouldn't dictate the way the movie goes, but there are a lot of people that will look at a rotten review or a rotten tomato score and that will dictate if they go see it or not. And this it's a mass. It's, it's almost so... it reminds me of Men in Black where uh, Tommy Lee Jones is saying he's like People are dumb, panicky, unreasonable and stuff. A person is smart. That's smart, yeah. And I'm paraphrasing because I said it the opposite way. Uh, but it's just an aggregate of all that stuff. So what's your cutoff? This is my question because I have a cutoff. When I'm going through Netflix, I check IMDb. If it's in the fives, I'm probably out. I'm probably not taking that chance unless it intrigues me past the point. But, you can... but six and up, like like I said, one of my sleeper movies is basic. And it's rated like 6.2. And so if I love that movie and it's rated 6.2, I'm going to take a chance on a 6 plus. Yeah, but like you can – can you not look at what a movie is about, who's in it, who the directors are, what the general idea is, and then look at the review and decide, well, that 5 looks a little bit ridiculous. I'm going to actually go check this movie out. 100%. Like you can do that. And and I, can, I that's what I, that's how I look at it. But It's considering the it. source. Yes. So, that's the other thing. Like, I, I watch a lot of reviewers, but the reviewers that I watch are the YouTube ones. And now that I do reviews on YouTube, yeah. it's kind of, I do it in a way as if I was sitting here, just like with you guys, just talking about it. So, because I'm not overly, I don't think further than I need to yeah. a lot of the times, unless it's a movie that deserves it. There are movies that deserve that. But the ones that I look at, they're just talking about it like they're just normal people. Yeah. But I do have ones that most of the time I disagree with, but I still go back to them because they're able to articulate their point. And even if I disagree with somebody, uh, if you can articulate your point to yeah, me yeah. and I get where you're coming from and I can see that in the movie, that puts you on my roster. So, yeah, I do see it, but I do also consider the source because there are other ones that I've come across. I don't disagree with them, and I don't disagree the way they're presenting their yeah. argument. Yeah. And there are definitely critics out there that are like, I shot Edwards from like Fox. It's like I will never ever listen to a review from him because he's it, his reviews look like he's getting paid to make these reviews. Yeah, there's a lot of it's, and there's a lot of yeah. people that are like that. You're right. So seek out credible sources for the reviews and go to go to them because you're right. We live in a world where the general public can just say any opinion they have without any wow. credibility or just like you handle fake news, handle movie reviews. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and uh, exactly. a lot of the times it's. For me, I'll look at the premise. I'll look at, like you mentioned, who's directing it, who's writing it, what their last few projects are. All of yeah. that you can kind of see. And if you've seen their movies, then that should that should help come up with your own decision. And then from there, you obviously watch the movie, and then you you get your own your own opinion on it. And then, like you mentioned, you go after it and you start looking at it because all that plays a role. There are certain directors and writers and actors that I'm probably going to the movie. No matter what like I will not like when Nolan so are, who are you no well no straight up when Nolan released Dunkirk mm. I it didn't even get past like ten seconds I was like well that's my next movie <laughs> <laughs> I was like well yeah. like what are we talking about this is Nolan this yeah. is in my opinion okay so Nolan. who are your three who are your three directors <laughs> oh, you, see, you three. see three directors across the screen who are the three that you're like those are the three movies I'm watching this year if they put out a movie this weekend. Like, my, well, I'm going to give you my two guarantees because I only have two that I'm probably going to no matter what because of directing. According to your criteria, yes, only two. Okay. Fincher would be my three, but he's not a shoe in He's not like I have to go. Okay, okay. I love his directing style. But um, Chris Nolan is number one for me. I think he is a genius and Tarantino is number two. I think the way he writes in his dialogue and the way he creates characters and – the writing is so – both those human beings, Chris Nolan and Tarantino, I believe they are the only two humans on earth that could do that the way they do it. I think a lot of people – it's like Prince in music. He's the only – Michael Jackson in music. He, they're the only two that could right. do it like that. So you're not saying they're necessarily the best, 
But the way that they do it, nobody can do it. Okay. Like the writing of all of those movies of Tarantino and Nolan is just on a level to me that it, it actually blows my mind. I'm like, whoa, 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 I gotta watch that again. I have to really see the nuance of that dialogue that Tarantino creates at the beginning of every one of his movies. And I want to think about what was he thinking when he was writing that? What motivated him to come up with those characters talking about that topic? He might be the guy that I asked that question the most about. Yeah. Like, we're like, where did that even come from? Like, I love it. But that's true genius. And Nolan, I mean, like Inception for me is that movie that I've watched over 15 times and I still question things. And that level of genius to me. I still think you give that movie too much love. I, I might, because I absolutely love that movie, and I think it's pure genius. Um, and the second thing that I give Nolan credit for is taking the Batman series that I felt was always underserved, and he elevated it to almost mass connection. Like, anyone could have connected with that. You didn't have to be a superhero fan. Even though Batman, by default, has that naturally written into the story people will flock and it's already in it and it's already there yeah but th that's that's my nolan right there that's g um i'm gonna go scorsese i'm gonna go tarantino and then my third is really tough um i'm going between kubrick but i do love uh fincher so i think i might put fincher uh a three uh nolan I respect the hell out of him. I think he's uh, right now. If you want to source, like if someone, like if, if today someone was like, "Who is the guy?" It is still Nolan. The movies that he makes, the, the movies that he makes are on such another level uh, from a thinking standpoint, from an execution standpoint. Even Interstellar, which I know you guys love, Interstellar, right? Behind Inception, but love Interstellar. Uh, yeah. I liked Interstellar. In a lot of parts, but I think a part of it, a lot of it, is also it's over me, and maybe, and that's the beauty and that's the genius yeah. of Nolan. A lot of his old oh, over me. I felt I could pick more holes in Interstellar from right. a story standpoint and consistency and stuff For like sure. that than I would his other projects. But that compared to some other movies is still a yeah. top tier movie hey. and you have to respect I don't want to hear any insecurity about that going over your head bro because <laughs> I I had to google research yeah. go to critical reviews yeah. double check sources I was sitting there going like okay so Interstellar what was that about <laughs> but I loved it and that's why because I normally don't like movies that would be considered difficult to watch yeah. or that aren't easy relaxing flowing um, masterpieces, but for me, he challenges me in just enough way that it's in my realm of understanding, but just a bit out of reach, and I love that. Yeah, that you're, you're is the go journey. For more, if you didn't care, and if he didn't do it so masterfully, you wouldn't care to investigate it more on your own. Exactly, you're actually wanting to get to his level. Yeah, yeah. and it's that like is one. that is a mark of of uh, of a talent. That is a mark of a, a leader, I guess, in industry, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but yeah, I would Scorsese's movies because Goodfellas is probably my number one. Like it's my top movie, top five. Mine and my sister, mine yeah. and my sister's like movie that we watch together. I watch Goodfellas almost all the time. Probably throughout the year, I'll watch it five or six times. If it's on TV, doesn't matter where it is, I'm watching it and I'm finishing it, and it's gonna happen. Right? All I have to say is the scene when him, when Ray Liotta is walking in the back of the club to get mm -hmm. to this table at the front. Like, that yeah. scene alone for yeah. that movie is just, like, and it's, it's amazing. It's transcendent. I will watch Shawshank Redemption on TV any Friday, Saturday, Sunday night with the commercials while it sits on my Apple TV, <laughs> and I will wait. See, Shawshank is another one. I, Shawshank is a brilliant, brilliant movie, and, like, one of those ones that uh, didn't get the love right out of the game. It took 20 it years. It took a long time. Fight Club is another one, a Fincher one. Yeah. That developed a cult classic. Now, when you look at it, I understand the gripes people have with it. It's you look at it and it, it's got some stuff that doesn't hold up today. There's some underlining tones there that were great when it was made. It doesn't hold yeah. up. 
taking that aside as a move. What are we talking about here? Fight Club. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you bet. You bet. Stop. You talking about Shawshank? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that holds up uh, always. Yeah, actually, Sha- at Shawshank in this day and age, the way people look at other people and identities and all that, kind of gives you a almost another perspective. Specifically, talking about the ending yeah. and how it tied up and yeah. how how it could continue from there in your own mind, which I think is quite forward thinking at the time that it yep. was released. Yep. Uh, I think that's why it didn't do so well. Yeah, because I think it was actually a little bit ahead of its time. Yeah, there was a lot of that stuff. And then, uh, yeah, Tarantino. Tarantino movies. I You can't, like you, you've already mentioned most of it. Uh, it's really tough to compete against a guy like that um, just because he knows who he's writing for. The fact that Inglorious Bastards didn't, wasn't, wasn't going to get released unless Christoph Waltz showed up because he knew what that who that character yeah. was. Yeah. Like little atten- details like that. We talked about John Travolta briefly before we yeah. started this. Right now he's a dud. And he was a dud for a while and it was the one that came back to him. But that's because he understands Travolta more than Travolta understands yeah. himself. Yeah. And he made a foolproof script for him to follow. And all he had to do was follow it, and it turned out perfect for him. Oh, that's that's yeah, Travolta's role. Yeah, he had his own nuance to it, but that was that was it. Yeah, I agree. H. Uh, Nolan, I think I yeah. think we've now decided that it's Nolan. Yeah. He's the best in the biz. Oh, is he your number one though? In to go watch in a movie theater. Even just top three directors, like we're top three directors. This is I just thought this is top three directors. Yeah, so. yeah. But you're right; it was to go see who. Yeah. So anyways, still kind Nol- of, it still dictates it. Nolan. All I have to say is the movie. Memento, Prestige, and Interstellar. Like, See, you make those three movies for me. Yeah. And then you add in a transcendent movie, like, or a transcendent trilogy, like the Dark Knight trilogy. Yeah. That took for the first time a superhero movie and didn't make it a superhero movie, like you were saying. Yeah. Where it was like, this movie should probably be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar. Yeah. And potentially should have won. Yeah. I think, uh, because of what it did. Uh, number two, Clint Eastwood. Um, Clint Eastwood has been a favorite of mine since the movie Unforgiven, the first time I saw it. Mm. Uh, and the guy knows how to write and create characters that will crush your soul and make you super happy. By the way, the thing that's funny about Clint Eastwood is the way I perceive his, him as a man is zero emotion. <laughs> Yet his movies make me cry potentially more than any other like, director. <laughs> but like, yeah, nobody writer. directs in the masculinity, masculinity that, that Clint Eastwood does. Like, his movies have a masculine feel to him. His characters do. Yeah. Like, the way they purvey emotion as characters is very masculine. Mystic River, Million Dollar Baby, like, all those characters. But yeah. the emotion of a masculine person who is stoic breaks you down even more. Like, that's why Clint Eastwood is so good. That is brilliantly said, actually, by the yeah. way. That's just the way it is, right? Million Dollar Baby crushes me every, every time. single time. When I've seen that movie more times than I should. Like, for that emotional... Like, <laughs> Requiem... Yeah, I don't need that negativity in my life. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I've seen it. I saw it once a long time ago. Never have to see it again. <laughs> million Dollar Baby, just everything leading up to it. But when that, that ending comes, it just cr- – But everything leading up to oh. it. And like you said, there was – The good thing was is that, uh, you know, no pun intended, he never pulled punches with uh, – No, I'm blanking on Swank's it. character? Swank's character. Yeah. Uh, he never He never downplayed her at all. Like you talk about masculinity, it's mm-hmm. easy to do with men. Yeah. But when she's the only one there, he was able to to just bring out su- such a tour de force for her character in amongst all these other people. I mean, you've got you got Morgan Freeman there, if I remember correctly. You're right, yeah. And he and she out acts him. Yeah, yeah. And she has more of a presence than he does. And that's Which is so to funny. Because she she's had like only really two big roles that people have really respected her for, which yeah. is Million Dollar Baby, and Boys Don't Cry. Yeah. And it's like, it's so straight. She'll be gone forever, and then she'll just come back, and she'll have this huge hit. Yeah. Anyways. Clint Eastwood, for me, like in Mystic River, the tension that you feel around Tim Robbins in that movie about the what really happened, what is going on, I don't like this character, but I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. But he's not giving himself a chance. Uh, yes, and it, there's just so much discomfort. But in that discomfort, I loved watching it. Yeah. And it, he, Clint Eastwood, in I guess he didn't write that, so I'm, this is more of a plot discussion. But that story is hard. <laughs> yeah, and like one of the other things Clint does is like his environment. Like when he creates like sets right. or like locations, it's like 
those sets and those like like Mystic River is a perfect example. So I've been to Boston and, and been to those streets like that are in Mystic River movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like I've lived there and it's like he nails it. Like you're just like it's I very feel clean editing. Like it's very clean, but it always has this I don't know what the edit um button would be, but it's almost like tone darker. It's, yeah, like right. Fincher it's has that cool. really dark yeah, feel, but it's almost like over the top dark yeah. feel. Yeah. Um, even in social me, network, yes, right? it's even that a is dark where it, it is seen as the most. Like seven is like whatever that's supposed to yeah. be dark, yeah. but like social network that's <laughs> supposed to be a, bright and uplifting, and all of a sudden it just it has that feel. But to me, Clint Eastwood has that. Yeah, oh, and it's like it's part of your style, right? Like his shots are like that heavy tamer. contrast, dark blacks, light whites, yeah. and it's just clean and it's got this um, tone to it. So yeah, so Clint is the other, and then of course it's Tarantino. Like you, how can you not go see? Yeah, this he's movie? gotta be in there for Tarantino is great because he's unapologetically Tarantino. Like yeah. it's like you watch a movie that he's made and you're like, that is a Tarantino movie. You know I don't even need to know who the director is. I just yeah. know watching it that Tarantino made this movie. I'm surprised at all three of us being. You know, I'm not an expert. You guys are definitely more into movies than I am. But we all seem to agree because Scorsese would be my number four. Yeah. yeah he's right there we're, we're not far off. Well, well and the thing is, the divide between these guys, I would, like, if even if you were to increase the five to ten, it slivers in it's between. It's just style. It's yeah. just like on the style that you it prefer. Is. Yeah, it has it nothing is. to do with whether or not those guys are good or bad or better directors. They're all phenomenal well, directors. And going back to Clint, <laughs> most of the movies that uh, the thing that I take away from most of his movies is he's able to drag out a specific scene without overstaying his welcome. Yeah. Yet you're there and you're kind of you're building up with it. Yeah. And very few people can do that. And I can't pinpoint how he does it. Back with Man with No Name. Back with The Unforgivens. Yeah. All those. A lot of the scenes are just, it's a build, it's a build, it's a build, it's a build. A lot of understanding. It keeps building. Yeah. But most directors, when they try to do that, they end up overstaying and you lose it. At one point, you're like, okay, I'm done now. Right? Yeah. I would say well, Tarantino he, risks that at times, he does, by the way. So he I was this. just going to say that. I was like, they're almost on complete opposite sides of the spectrum. Yeah. Like, it's, that's, I was literally just going to say that. The technique is to create tension. Yes. And then to relieve that tension and almost create the next scene to be different and with a contrast to add a different emotion. So you're kind of on that roller coaster. Yeah. But Tarantino actually gives you tension so prolonged that you're sitting there antsy and wanting it to move. And then when it moves, you feel that relief. And Glorious yes. Bastard, when they're in the bar and the, it, like, yep. that was a phenomenal. I, it, well, that's just the best that, scene he's ever done. No, I would argue the opening scene for Inglorious Bastard. Yes. Because so long, that, so shot, uh, yeah. that so whole great. sequence from start to finish made me completely uncomfortable. And oh. Christoph Waltz, the way, like, the when Hans Landa sits down and the way he introduces himself and everything How like that. How pleasant he is. Like, and the build up there was in the writing and the way he was conducting his investigation. Because you knew he knew. He, you knew, like, you could tell he knew everything. You but knew he like, knew. How would he know? Yeah. And then the second he does that turn, and he starts talking about uh, the owl and the rat, and you could you could see it slow like, build. Yeah, oh, Every, and then yeah, when when you cool. notice, when, and I and I and I forget the other actor's name, but that's across from him. And you just see him. The more he's doing it, the more his hand starts shaking while yeah. he's doing his pipe. Yeah, and even though it was undercut slightly with him bringing out his pipe, yeah, it was such a short undercut, which was actually really so Tarantino. So yeah, that was the Tarantino in that scene until. It eventually happened. Yeah. But just that bar scene and the and the intro was just like it's brilliant. But yeah. then you even go to like and in that movie, I consider that movie just building of tension all across the board yeah. because you go to the cafe and when he sits down with another Shoshana, great, tr- and great scene. Ta- just even And you know he knows. And when he stops and when he stops the waiter or makes sure that she gets creamed. Yeah. yeah. Like even just that moment where it's just like you, it, it tricks you, but yeah. you know, too. Like, it's yeah. weird. Okay, so I have a quick question for you guys. We talked about four main uh, directors. So Clint, yeah. Nolan, Tarantino, Scorsese. What is their high and low point in the career? Like, what is Nolan's low point? Oh, man. I don't know if he's had a miss. Like, I think that's why he's so good. Like, I just, yeah. I can't think of a miss. I'll say for me, Interstellar or The Dark Knight Rises, but I think I put The Dark Knight Rises below Interstellar. 
Okay. By by uh, quite a bit, only because I was quite disappointed with Dark Knight Rises. It right. didn't feel like it was a movie he wanted to make. And from what I understand, there's some publications that have put out that he didn't really want to make it. He he didn't. Okay, like just like, to confirm that because like, there's some Dark that he wanted to like finish his. it, but yeah. like like Dark Knight was kind of like his. But that first scene yeah. in Dark Knight Rises is is amazing in the plane okay. when. Yeah. Bane starts talking. Whoa, you hear that voice. You're like, and I get okay, why I'm you in. don't you have like me it. for three hours. Yeah. You have. And like, I get why you don't like it, G, because there are a lot of parts of it that even myself and, and personally, yeah. my favorite of the three is Dark Knight Rises. Crazy. It's yeah. not the best done one. Yeah. That's Dark Knight. Some actually say it's Batman Begins, yeah. which I also think is a great movie. That's um, amazing see, movie. See, and the argument also is if uh, Dark Knight never had the Joker. Like, take the Joker out of the Dark Knight. Oh, then I'd like Batman that. Begins as the better movie. And that, that's where my divide goes, too. I'm like, it's such a Joker movie. It's, he owns the into everything. He's not there, and yet he's there. Yeah. yeah. He's, he is the greatest villain on screen we have ever seen. The, I, dark, the dark Knight Rises just doesn't flow as a movie. It's that, very that's choppy. That All of a sudden, he's in a cave. No, 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 no. Now we're blowing up stadiums really rapidly without a lot of, like, build-up. No, they're in the sewer system. Yeah. It's like, it was very choppy, but it was, he just fed through that movie to get it done almost. Not him as in his directing quality. A lot of people say that. That's what <laughs> it feels like. It just feels like it's really rushed. I think I just liked the themes and I think I liked yeah. the closure. Like, I, I, I think that's what it was, but I 100% think that Dark Knight is the best man of the trilogy. Yeah. There's no, I don't think I can even argue that, but um, I see what you're saying about Dark Knight Rises. On the sure. high though for Nolan? Like, what is what is your favorite Nolan movie? Interstellar. It is, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Interstellar. Interstellar, I went to the... I lived in Boston at the time. I went and saw it three days in a row. So there was a movie Crazy. theater across the street from where I worked. And I went... I saw it the first time and I was like, I'm going tomorrow. And you have to see it. See, yeah. mine... You have to see it in... In the theater. Yeah. So, so mine is in... If in an order, would be Inception, The Prestige, Memento, then Interstellar. Those are his best three? No, that's like, I'm just saying Interstellar's four for me, not even number one, but it's number one for... But those are your best three Nolan movies for you? Your yes. favorite? Inception is is like uh, yeah, no, how... It's so one of that's my, your first? Yes. And then your very bottom? I'm going to have to say Dunkirk, and I know... What? H is, H is, you're going to lose it. I get it. That is... <laughs> I can't believe you just said that. That is... This is the best. That is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The fact that he didn't win Best Picture this year is a travesty okay. to the Academy. Stop. Let me just give the credit it deserves. The sound editing, the cinematography, the the actual direction of it, great. I can appreciate there's not really a main character, and there's a lot of subtle, quiet moments that build that tension. I love it. It's Nolan at his worst is still better than 95%. Oh, yeah. That's so let me be clear about this. Yeah. But with what I said earlier about how I expect him – to write me something that takes me to another level and makes me question everything. That that story alone wasn't that Did it feel insane less to Nolan me. Than the, other, than the one that you appreciate the most? It's the one time where I think actually Nolan could be replaced. Wow. Yes, I do. I, I That's a bold statement, and I say that kind of loosely. So I, I think that's movies, his movies are subjective, so. I think that's his crowding achievement. Dunkirk right. is his crowning achievement. It's okay, like, so in, 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 in what way? Like, let's say over oh, so, Interstellar. Let's so one of the biggest, so one of the biggest, like, obviously you nailed a lot of, like, sound editing. Um, the score, even. The story, guys, is brilliant. Like, his theme of time, like, is, and theme of time is throughout all of Nolan's movies. Like, they're all there. That's a good point. And, that like, the point. way his movies are lined up, they're yeah. never linear. So, like, he took that to the extreme in Dunkirk, and I think he beautifully, like he beautifully executed, it, and it all finishes at the same time. One hour, one day. What is it? One hour, one day. Uh, I'm one week. Too. Something like that. Yeah. So, and like, and then at the end of the movie, they all come together. Sorry about spoilers. Um, yeah. it's been out for a while. Yeah. Um. So there's that, and then everyone's biggest gripe is like, there's no characters in it. There's no the character is the story. Everybody contributes <laughs> to the story to make one character. But I didn't, know of, I didn't know about the story of Dunkirk, about this, you know, them having to escape this, this like, like choke point yeah. of, of yeah, World like something War like the II. greatest retreat in, like, war history. But, right, there right, was right. something about it that I, did, I didn't connect to that. It, it was underwhelming, the story to me. The actual story of that choke point being a bunch of soldiers that need to get saved. There was something that fell short, and that's why I put it at the bottom. But again... Him at the bottom. Yes. I, I, 
But even I would say you're not the only one because like yeah. I have a lot of friends that are into movies as much as we are, and they all say the same thing. They're like, I didn't think Dunkirk was that good, and I was like, and I guess it depends on what you're looking for too, because on what you connect with, you connected with the story more, and I I don't buy into the. Um, I don't buy into the complaint of people, oh, there's no character and stuff like that, because he was going with something different. We what didn't have to worry about, I mean, we obviously worried about the people there, but it was what he constructed out of it yeah. and what he created and the tension that he brought into it. And Incredible. The, the, again, going back to how that tied in with the sound, whereas for you, yeah, I can understand. You didn't have that connection with anybody and you're forced to connect with what's going on and as opposed to any any one person or any five people or any you know, groups of stories that are connected right. to this event, which right. which makes sense. I get that. I do. Yeah. I uh, just, yeah. I just think he got snubbed this year hard. That's fair. There, sure. you know, the director director this year, Oscar-wise, there was a lot of was competition. A, it was one of the best Oscar years. It sure. was a very good Oscar. Yeah. There was, ve- there, I don't think there was a, any, emo- any moment there that I was actually, you know, really looking at a category and saying like, you know, these three people don't need to be in here. There's been years where it's been yep. like that. Yep. Um, I would put, I would honestly put the prestige at his highest. I can't argue that. I can't I, argue that. I adore the prestige. So and especially I. because when I first saw the prestige, I didn't know much about Christopher Nolan That's at exactly all. exactly how I went for And I think I was almost too young for that movie. Then I rewatched it again. I'm like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. It's... I was I was I was blown away. Uh, Memento is very close because once I saw Prestige, I went back to Memento. The uh, Batman trilogy I put as a you whole. Put as a whole, yes. It's kind of like <clears throat> the first two. It's a bounce back and forth. Again, three. I've already uh, I've already you know said my stuff about, but it's really tough because I think between three and Interstellar might be my bottom, but it goes to the argument of it being. You know, that's better than 90% of the stuff. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, yeah. Uh, Interstellar, for, it, was, it, was a, it was an issue with the way that the story was put together and how it abandoned itself at the end. Now, the argument could be made that, you know, it's about love. It, it is. And, and, the, and not that I have a hate on love or anything like that, but Anne Hathaway's character abandoned what I felt her character was for love. Then the Matt Damon thing, which I thought was pretty interesting and, and pretty crazy. They could have cast anybody, I think, for that. They, they didn't did. need to do They did it because Matt Damon wanted to be in it. Yeah. Uh, that part almost felt like more of a detraction from it. Yeah. Uh, not to say that they could have taken it out. I don't know how the movie would have gone without it. I agree. Um, I agree that's the part that they didn't just take out. For me, the way that it ended up going uh, and the way that it ended up being and how you know he just so happened to be the guy that found the coordinates out of nowhere and then they're like... Okay, now we're fast forwarding. We're going up. Yeah, so yeah. it was pacing issues. It was yep. some of those plot lines and an abandonment of some of the characters that we had gotten. Now I'm not saying characters can't grow, but it felt like Anne Hathaway's character was boom. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to do this and abandon all this for love. Yeah, yeah and yeah. then the whole black hole thing and everything with Murph and everything was for love, right? It just didn't add up for me. And most of the time, when I look at it, and the more I, you know, look into movies. Uh, and and how I've appreciated and respect the hell out of Christopher Nolan's movie when I go back to like a prestige because you're going to compare his movies to his movies. Hundred percent. I don't compare Interstellar to a Tarantino movie. You can't. You can't. Right. So that's where I have my gripes for Interstellar with him. And like I get that. And like I need to make this clear: when a movie is about space, yeah, and like it's done that well. Like first time I saw Odyssey 2001, oh, it's geez. like it doesn't matter. It's, it's already my anniversary, by the way. I know. Crazy, no, crazy. So like that, that that has to be known. Yeah. Um. Okay. My top three. So Interstellar is number one. Yes, a personal favorite. My original personal favorite from Christopher Nolan before Interstellar came out was The Prestige. Yeah. Um. I think that's one of the best put together movies I've ever watched. That like, and he, he and Hugh Jackman too. Like you expect it from Christian Bale. It's, he's excellent. But he really brought out. Excellent. Hugh Jackman. Like, man. Bowie as Tesla. Like, it was all great. Oh, man, that was fantastic. Um, and, like, I think they, ex- I think in the movie they explain the magic trick. Like, what, like, show something ordinary, then show that it's extraordinary, yep. and then... And then you got your prestige. And then you got your prestige. Yeah. Um, I think it's, like, what is it? The something, the turn, and then yes. the prestige. Yeah, the pledge, uh, the pledge, the turn, the prestige. There you go. And so the movie is lined up exactly the way as how the magic so is, right? Really it's like there's yes. the pledge, 
There's the turn, and then there's the prestige, and the prestige is... Can we talk about how the illusionist popped up a year later? <laughs> like, who was he sniffing out in Christopher Nolan's crew to find out what he's up to and just pop... Like, people get those mixed up for those non-Nolan loving. That happens, oh, a couple, that happens a couple of times, and I forget the last one, but that one's the one I remember the most is because it was Prestige and then Illusionist. Yeah. And I watched The Illusionist, I'm like, I don't like it's this. Not it's close. not even close. And I love Paul Giamatti. It's me too. As an actor, I think he's phenomenal. He but is yeah. hungry for that magic he in the He was illusion. in a movie that made me hate the Oscars, which was Sideways. Oh, um, yeah. And I thought that Sideways should have won Film of the Year that year. Fair enough, yeah. Um... So, yeah, I'm a huge Paul Giamatti fan because of America's Splendor. Mm. Um, and then my number three, um, it's really hard for me because I, I want to say um, Dunkirk because it is his masterpiece. But I have to put the Batman trilogy in there. It has to be in there. Like as a whole. It, it, yeah. It just, yeah like, and it's, it's tough it's to just, have one without the other. It's just Nolan. It's yeah. like that's – I think when you talk about Nolan, there are three movies you have to talk about. Memento. Yeah. Because it's his first movie where people are like, this guy's for real. Yeah. Dark Knight trilogy. And Dunkirk. And that's the thing. It was for real. So Prestige is not in there. Inception isn't in there. The three you have to talk about. I'm, I'm saying you have to talk about them as the points in Nolan's career that are the most notable. Like, for me, like when I look at Nolan and I look at his body of work, there are three points in his career. There's Memento when he started. There's the Dark Knight trilogy that made people know who he was. And then there yeah. was Dunkirk where he's like, I can also direct brilliant films. Like, those are the three f- films that you have to talk about when describing Nolan. It's like his benchmarks. Yeah. And then, then, then every, all the brilliance in between kind of thing. And right? Memento set the tone of how he does movies, like non-linear. Um, like the way he describes and moves his characters throughout his movies. It all starts at Memento, and then it continues on. For well, sure. And I think with Memento, tone setter. It's, it's almost less of a... It's non-linear, because he's, he's established that in his other stuff. But I think what it is, is fully realized story. And I okay, think, yeah. like, and I think what with, with Nolan, it is he. Interstellar took him eleven years. I know that is no joke. And a part of that is because of the science. Like, and that's why yeah. Interstellar for me is so good because the science yeah. is is so good. But he, it, it, you know, uh, you, you talk about people that have that kind of work on the fly, and you can tell that because sometimes the movie shifts in tone and changes and yeah. all that, and they have a drop. He knows what he's doing from yeah. start to finish. Yeah. Uh, and and Memento is it was a is a perfect I think example for it being his first one. It just shows like no, I can not only construct this story that you're just kind of confused the entire way you're going until you realize what happens, and then at the end you're like, I have like like I the prestige. Yeah. Then you have to go back and you're like, how did I not know anything about Fallon? And I and like I'll like I don't notice a lot of stuff that some people pick out. Like some people are like, oh, I've noticed that before. Sure you did. Yeah. And, and if you did, good for you. But for me, like, that is a reveal. You're, you're right. Going back to David Fincher, uh, another person, Fight Club, when I first saw it, the more I've seen it, the more I pick up of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you see Durden popping in there more and more. There are some stuff where you can poke holes in, in the plot. And stuff, for sure. But again, it's a fully formed, it's obviously based on a book as well. Right. But being able to translate something like that and, and do it in the way that he did was another kind of force that, you know, Nolan showed in Memento in space. Yep. And, and I, yeah, and I think Dark Knight, the Dark Knight trilogy was the first time where I was like, oh, right, Jonathan Nolan is a master storyteller. Like, yeah. he, or sorry, Christopher Nolan and Christopher Jonathan Nolan, Nolan and, Jonathan and his, yeah, his, his brothers yeah, writing the stories. Like, they are just master storytellers. Yeah. Like, they just know how to tell a story. And they do On that story. topic about calling the end of movies, though, I will give myself a lot of credit that as a young man, I called Sixth Sense before it hit the ending. Oh, you did. 100% yeah. did. I remember looking at my sister and going, this is what's going to happen. And it was bang on. And that one fooled them. It I fooled me for sure. I didn't see it until I was already spoiled. Like, when I saw it, I already knew it was. Uh, you you realize, kind of like though. A, I, I missed out on that part of getting. Let's break this down, though. He gets shot at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, his wife, they never have a conversation. He just talks to her and she talks to him. But it's never double engagement. Right. right. And the kid sees dead people. It, it's when you think back, although not many people caught it, and I get it. For sure. How is that not getting uh, caught? You're right. You're 100%. Like, after I saw it, I was like, God damn, how did I know that? <laughs> it's like, you know what, though? All the signs that are there. That was yeah. the genius of M. Night. And he might Man, actually it's... be the director that fell off the most. He's the toughest director for me to talk about. Because, yeah. like, 
six like six cent. Billy. Unbreakable. Like I will, I will put Unbreakable as his best. It is movie, his best movie. And I will also put it now when we're in the 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 landscape of superhero movies. One of the best superhero movies. Yes, it is. It is. He actually may have done. He may have actually been the first guy to make a superhero a serious movie. He may have actually done it before it Christopher Nolan. That movie. Like, dry, that movie is amazing. M Night is up to no good. <laughs> like that's a, all I can say is what. Just, I, we we shouldn't even talk about him because it's it's really hard for me to talk about because well, he's I will not say, here. I will I refuse to talk about him behind his back. <laughs> he's not here to defend himself. I, I, I watched the visit though. Have you seen the visit? The visit. I have not. It's what is the first one he came back with, which was like, it's a it's good. Really, it's it's it kept split me was it was a train split wreck. The, I it was liked good. split, especially when I found out. How it connects and it's part of it's all a trilogy. It's part of a trilogy. And I, re- I'm a big fan of James McAvoy. I am too. I really like James. McAvoy. Uh, ever since the movie Atonement. Uh, see, I will put it ever since Filth. I haven't seen there's, Filth. There's a there's a movie he was in called Filth where he played. Uh, and for those of you who haven't seen it, go check it out. I won't say it, but he does. You know, kind of a intro level to what you kind of see in Split. Uh, and it, and it's extremely well done, and it's not from M Night, but it was one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite James McAvoy ones. It's twisted, it's crazy, but yeah, Split. I I I liked it. I liked it. I, I didn't liked it too. I didn't love it, but I loved the concept of it more than the movie itself. Well, one hundred percent. I I could not wait to watch that movie. I was yeah. like, M Night can be a genius when he. Tries. Yeah. He has it in him. <laughs> when he and gives it not, any effort at all, he could be a genius. He's the next Spielberg yeah. like he did back When he has a day. legitimate idea that works. Yeah. That, that movie is the epitome of something that built me up and just completely let me down. That's yeah. fair. Fair. But, I mean, I don't, I don't even want to explain. I don't even want to yeah. waste too much time going too far into it. Well, all I have to say is a perfect example of M. Night Shyamalan's career is the movie Science. It's so good until it gets to the point where, like, oh, it's, it's just water. Like, yeah, that's what beats them. Oh, so oh, yeah. they landed on a planet that was seventy percent water, and it's just water. Yeah, like okay, great. Yeah. It's like, bro, how did you miss this? Yeah. He did you that know, with, the, like, with uh, the village too. I didn't mind the village. Oh, I like the village. I think that is him at his number three highest. Yeah. For me, it had the same thing that science had. Where towards the end, I was just like, well, this is just dumb. Uh, that, sure, there there are yeah. some turns that happen that people buy into, yeah, and yeah. some people don't. Um, I didn't buy into that one. Yeah, no, that's you fair. mean like it, 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 the realism of it was so maybe and the fact out there. that what it looked like it was more like anim- like it looked like uh, I'm trying to remember I haven't seen it for a very long time so bear with me here but just the 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 reveal his his reveal and uh, it's very it, underwhelming it, it was underwhelming it was it felt cheap it felt like like you could have done something better than this uh, in comparison to that signs was the same kind of thing it was kind yeah. of like oh whatever stupid. Um, the and they showed the alien. I wish the happening was, is, is one of those... <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing. Because the whole time you're like, what's happening? But it's a thematic <laughs> movie about how the environment... It's it's actually about how we are punishing the environment. The environment's yeah. coming back at us. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, yeah, no. <laughs> like when you cast Mark Wahlberg as a science teacher. <laughs> don't, don't, you wanna, don't you care about science, guys? <laughs> <laughs> you about science? Like, okay, okay. Okay. Tell them about science. Tell them about science. <laughs> and like the guy talking about the hot dogs and everything. Like, oh, uh, it's so bad. It, it's one of those. Uh, I put that up in those so bad it's good. Like kind the room, like yeah. almost like the room. Have you ever seen the room? The room. Oh man, this movie. Uh, so James Franco recently did his movie called oh. The Disaster Artist. Oh, right. And right. it was based off the room from Tommy Wiseau and, yeah, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. And the room is one of those. It's so terrible. Yeah, yeah. I've actually I. I've seen parts of the room because I wanted yeah. to know who Tommy Wiseau is. I wanted to, like, I'd heard of him and, like, I'd heard about this movie that was so bad it was good. Yeah, and, and it's such a cult follow. It's so, so it. ridiculous. Like, everything about it. How did he even get money to make that movie? He financed it himself. Apparently, he financed it himself. No, nobody but, knows where his money comes from, but he's super rich. No one knows what his age is because he doesn't tell anybody. No one knows where he comes from. I think he, uh, I think he said that he was from from Boston or something, or he's from, from Chicago or he's something like that. Clearly he's not. he's in his own enigma and the fact that this movie existed and it happened. But then when you look at the disaster artist from that perspective, it's actually a beautiful story. Yeah. Like I, I, I really enjoyed the disaster artist. It's like an American it's like it. it's like the American dream story. It is. Yeah, like that's what is. Tom Rizzo is or yeah. whatever his name is. But so then uh when we're so we're talking we talked uh, in Nolan and now we're gonna in terms of Tarantino, his best and his worst. Ooh. His worst? 
even though I enjoyed it, yeah. would be Hateful Eight. I'm with you. Um, his best. <sighs> That's a tough one. That's a tough one. So, you like, if I'm going to, there's three that always come into my mind. Yep. Glorious Bastards, mm-hmm. Pulp Fiction, yep. and then a personal favorite of mine, Jackie Brown. So underrated. Uh, so underrated, <laughs> understated. I Jackie Brown, Jackie is, Brown is phenomenal. So like those are my three Tarantino That's movies. That, and like my one. personal favorite is Jackie Brown. Yeah, but I think it has to be Pulp Fiction. Like oh, Pulp Fiction like, with its dialogue, its acting, its action, and it was Tarantino's it's, coming out first. Its comedy touches. It he it was him coming out, but in the biggest way possible. And it was the most Tarantino movie he's ever made. Big time. It's the that, most Tarantino movie. When, when you think of Tarantino, Kill, Bi- Kill Bill is Bill. very Tarantino to me it too. Is. It is. I would say though, when you're looking at if someone's gonna say like, uh, you're gonna pull Tarantino style, you're gonna pull everything in Tarantino's trunk. I mean, he still got stuff. Actors in included. Movies. Actors included. In Pulp Fiction as a package. As a package, mm-hmm. yeah. for sure. Yeah. Jackie Brown, so underrated. Uh, and you know that, like, Bridget Fonda is my girl. Yeah, she's <laughs> awesome. I love Bridget. Oh, and every like that movie was so so good, and like it was one of the ones I got late to. Uh, I didn't get like I got, I got way too late into that Me one, too. but I'm actually glad when I saw it because I loved it. When I, I thought you said it. you got laid oh, too. No, I was no. like, <laughs> man, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Blood Brothers. Blood Brothers. <laughs> So for you, uh, top Tarantino and lowest Tarantino. Did you say your lowest Tarantino? Yeah, you said yeah. Hateful Eight. You said Jackie Brown and lowest is Hateful Eight. Even though Hateful Eight's great. Um, I'm going to agree with Hateful Eight as low. It has. It kind of has to it be. It almost seemed like a movie he just almost snuck out. It was weird. Mm. And, he, and he put so much of his own personal want and need into that movie. Yep. The 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 fact that he was doing it like a caravan and it had your missions and everything like it's that. It's a slow burner like you've never it seen. Is, and that's yeah. why it's so good. Like, I do they're, love they're, slow burners. Yeah, they're, me, yeah. And, and, and again, when you've got writing like that. Yeah. So your bottom's hateful. It seems like he was the guy that he's like, I I can do a quick movie and make millions. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but it, I expect more from him. I don't know. Well, but he takes did, risks. It did not he, do as well as uh, as he expected. It cost him a lot of money to do that one in terms of like the rolling out party and then the caravan oh, yeah. and everything and like that. Yeah. And it wasn't as appreciated as he wanted it to be. That Don't was worry, Tarantino. Thing. I got you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's like we said, it's still Tarantino and it's better than exactly. most. But that movie, I don't know if I would watch again. And that's I, weird I for me get to say. With that. I, I couldn't watch it simply because it's a slow burner. And slow burners, once you've seen the ending, it's not so slow burning anymore. It's just boring. Especially in the, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Especially in the whodunit, right? Like yeah. when, when that whodunit style, same with The Sixth Sense. When, I, when right. I, I saw it and I'm like, I didn't get the hype. Obviously, it was spoiled for me. But even if, so when you look at it, once you get the reveal of The Sixth Sense, yeah. the rest of the movie is just whatever. Like it's not being groundbreaking. No. Um, so, it, it has to be Pulp Fiction. It just, it has to be, and it's hard, like, I would probably say Inglorious Bastards would be number two for me, but I have to give it to Kill Bill 1 for what it did for me at that time. I'm so happy you picked one over two, because most people pick two over no, one. Nobody picks two over one, that's insane. The scene where she grabs the samurai sword, like, at Hanzo's, like... Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I think the only good thing about, the, the best thing I got out of uh, Kill Bill 2 was uh, the Superman and Spider-Man uh, monologue that he has uh, to her. That is one of my favorite ones, and I've, I've taken it to, like, when people are talking about, well, why do you like Spider-Man more than Superman? And I, I talk about that, and <laughs> I, you know, like, just that that story and the way he's describing and how he gets those two yeah. characters, I'm yeah. like, it's amazing. The anticipation of two, I'm a sucker for, if you make me anticipate something, it really has to live up, and, and two didn't live up to it. Yeah, I, It was longer, it was way more dialogue, but it was drawn out. Um, and it went a little too off, like, sure showed the training montage, because that was in the yeah. second one, right? Yeah. You've seen it for a while either. Um, it went too into the realm of, you know, everyone's saying Tarantino just, you know, steals stuff that he's already seen, he uses yeah. other stuff, but he's Big able to deliver. Baby, yeah. yeah, exactly. That was like the one where I felt kind of derailed it a little bit and took away from it. I could have done without that training sequence, even like, though I love training montages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my thing. But Kill Bill 1, the way it... Uh, the thing I like about Tarantino is every movie has a bit of a theme. Like, yeah. there was the, you know, the Holocaust theme. There was the, you know, 
Southern racism theme. There was the woman power theme in Kill Bill. And it's very... There's a lot of that, actually. Some of it is explicit. Jackie Brown was a little bit of the woman power thing, but like it's it's some of it is explicit, but some of it is very like implied and subtle. And he never acted like this is like a woman power movie, but it was good to see those actors, those female actors in that role, like just take it over. Even though he's getting he's getting killed out here for his connections with whites. Oh, is he? uh, Well, we're not going to discuss that. (laughs) Yeah. That, that might be for another <laughs> another one way down the road. Yeah. No, it's sad. like, and again, Kill Bill is one of those ones people use it to say they, they pack them together and they're like, oh, I hate Kill Bill, but I don't think it's fair because, yeah, one and two are drastically different. Two had some really good parts to it, but not as a whole. Kill Bill part one, as a whole, start to finish, I enjoyed the hell out of it. Yeah, I loved it. The color in oh. Kill Bill, the... the <laughs> the fight scene where it just goes black and white long enough that you forget it's a color movie yeah, and then yeah. it kicks back in and you're like you didn't have to do that <laughs> and only you thought to do that to, again to create that tension to at the moment the lights turn off it reinvigorates you and then when they turn back on it reinvigor it invigorates you again yeah, yeah. and that is that is a level of directing that i just give so much credit for to think of those that little nuances. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what it is to me. Yeah. And, uh, but I think as I age and mature, I think movies like Django and, uh, Inglorious are probably going to live longer for me. Kill Bill is a more of a youthful movie to me. Sure. Yeah, so, and I was young when I saw it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to probably going to go Pulp Fiction for sure because that was the first Tarantino movie I ever watched. Ah. And then it led me to everything else. But, between, ter- between Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs. Those are my two. I was two. just about to say, I'm surprised Reservoir wasn't your first. Uh, first. Yeah, there's something about Reservoir Dogs. It's such a... Uh, the way that he constructed that story, specifically the part with uh, Tim Roth. I think it's Tim Roth. No. Yep. Yeah, Tim Roth. And... Being the undercover. Being the undercover, but that scene where he's training to be and how it led from one to the other and... It, it, it was... it was That one was... That was great about it. Everything about it was great. It was so contained... It was about a botched robbery and how these guys are dealing with it after. Um, and it's also a very Tarantino, like a that, Tarantino that is also movie. Very, and and yeah. just so so many iconic scenes in there. Uh, Mr. White, yeah, like a character like Mr. White, just no one could have written a sociopathic character. I don't think as much as Tarantino. Did. <laughs> I don't think that anybody could great. write anything like Tarantino. No, no, like, definitely. Like, but even like just the way that he was, and the crazy part was is that. He was still charming as cra- as as psychotic and, and as he was. Yeah, yeah. He was still charming when he's stuck in the middle. Will still always be the scene where the guy gets his ear cut off. But just when he's like, he's like moving back and forth and dancing along to it, and then he goes in. It's just these. It, it, it kind of like it's got these peaks and valleys to his character that are just so nuanced in that. But uh, yeah, Pulp Fiction for sure, number one, and then I would say. I'm really torn. Um, I think I would put Hateful Eight. I liked, I really liked Django until the end. What was it that you didn't like about the end? I felt it was convenient that he had, they let, they had him hanging. Yeah, yeah. About to singe off his stuff. Yeah. And yet he had his wanted thing in his pocket. You know what I mean? And then, t- like, unless they gave it to him because they were delivering oh, I him see off. What you're you know what saying. I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, at the end of Django, they run into Tarantino. You're he's right. In it, you're right. And then he just so happened to know that in his pocket was his wanted thing for the money yeah, to yeah. get himself out of it and then do the shooting and stuff. Uh, it, that was one of those things where it kind of was just like, why would you end it like that? You put now, that valid. That's a valid point because I was going to say, I thought you were going to say. And it is eventually, it is what you said, was it just seemed like the end was just like, okay, we're running out of time. Let's just tie this up and get, boom, get boom, it boom, finished. Boom, boom. Done. Yeah. That was, Django. That, but yeah. So, but I don't know if I put it at the very bottom because the rest of the movie and DiCaprio. And Christopher Waltz again. And Christopher Waltz again. Waltz. Yeah. And, and like, the acting nod for sure. That yeah. Would be great. That definitely. Yeah. And Jamie Foxx. Like, I mean, the last thing I would ever credit Jamie Foxx in terms of acting would be uh, Any Given Sunday. Or Ray. Or uh, or Ray, sorry, yeah, it can be, yeah, Ray I and Sunday, right. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, yeah, and this one, yeah, that was really good. Well, I also, I also liked him in Baby Driver. I know you're not a big fan of Baby Driver. Uh, it again, it had so much potential. I wanted to like it. Yeah. 
it it went too cheesy with me with the the music and the dancing and the matching. But that was the point of the movie. I know yeah. it was, but it, it I did, I wasn't in the mood for a musical. <laughs> and I don't like musicals, so I get that. The going back to music though, what I do love about Tarantino as well is his and Scorsese his ability to integrate music and how every song that has been better? in there. Yeah. Every time, like I told you, uh, stuck in the middle. Reservoir Dog. Yeah. Right away. Like, it's just going to happen. All the music. Girl, you'll be a woman soon. Pulp Fiction. Oh, like, Pulp Fiction. Uh, Preacher Man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, there's so many in there that when you hear them, it doesn't make me think of Dusty Springfield. It makes me think of Pulp Fiction. Yeah. And going right back to it. He's got a lot of, he does that. Scorsese is one of my favorites for that. And the reason is, is because he's able to put in a song that perfectly emulates the character and the scene and i'm going back to goodfellas the scene where de niro is looking at that guy from the bar and cream comes in oh and yeah. he's smoking his cigarette and he's just staring him down yeah. and it just hits do 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 and just that look that he gives yeah and, I, and i've seen the behind the scenes stuff where he's doing stuff he's like and he has he actually written de niro cream and that's like that's his notes and he works it with editing which the lady has been editing stuff forever but just being able part. to do that, and just when I hear that now, again, I think of, I think of De Niro in that scene, and they he's, do such a great job of it. He's the best at creating a soundtrack. Who's the best score maker in the business right now? Like we talking about, like Trent Reznor, like who sure. actually creates, like creates scores? Yeah, we are. We're also including Reznor. the Hans Zimmer. We're talking about the John Williams and all that stuff. Because I think it's. When I talk about movies, and I, I rarely talk about scores because a lot of people don't get yeah. like the impact of scores, but scores are so big for me. Like when it yeah. comes to movies, like that's why Clint Eastwood's also one of my favorites. Like Picks he's scores. excellent because he makes his own scores, he'll yeah. sing on his own scores. Um, Christopher Nolan uses who I think is the best in the business, Hans Zimmer, he to is. create his scores. Yeah. Um, and I think it's such an important part of the movie that a lot of people don't realize because yeah. it does create a tone and a mood in a movie. And I would argue it's it's equal to a lot of other things. Well, I think it's equal to cinematography. Like yeah. I just think they're kind of like in line. Right? Yeah. I think it's like it's cinematography <laughs> and a score. Like I think they're right there. And that's where Baby Driver to me is one that I adore for the fact that the sound editing and the way that. Every moment, the yes. way that the way that Edgar Wright put it together was that every moment that was happening, every gunshot, every door slam, yeah. every everything, time is on so a beat perfectly with what was going on the, with the song that he chose, and he was choosing songs from you know yeah. real life songs. He didn't really have really ambiatic you know with, with uh, music and stuff, but it was so perfect. It's uh, it's crazy that Kevin what? Spacey's character in that movie is atrocious. I didn't care for him in that game. He, he was just. Are we just saying this because he's getting killed out there? No, right no. I love it. Like straight up, he was I whatever. He was whatever. I felt he was more like I've seen him in House of Cards. He's done that role better yeah. in House of Cards. Yeah. So I just saw him as that. I love John Hamm in that though. Well, I just love John Hamm. John Hamm's <laughs> awesome. He should be Batman. I'm just putting it on. I, there. You I, know, I love but you, John Hamm was like yeah. overacted in that. It was like, is it a co comedic role? Is it? Well, John Hamm has those moments. Like, have you ever seen Mad Men? Oh yeah. Like, John Hamm has those moments in that show. Yeah. He's not, like, his character as John Draper is, like, one of my favorite characters ever on television. But John Hamm in The Town was, like... What's that? John Hamm in The, ta the in Town. The Town in general was a phenomenal wow. movie. You, yeah, you know my love for The Town. You know my love for Ben Boston. Affleck when he Boston. just directs. Yeah, he just when he directs. just directs. Yeah, yeah. I love him. Yeah. And we all know who now wrote Good Will Hunting. It was Ben Affleck. Like I, Matt, would, I would agree with that. Like Ben, Dick, Matt David, like we've seen how he portrays Boston and how much he loves Boston. Is one hundred percent Ben Affleck who wrote that? Well, I, I don't, I don't know who it was. Ben Affleck has never came out and said, "Oh yeah, that was yeah. my little cousin." <laughs> is that, I actually think Ben Affleck's career is going to rise and rise and rise, and I think Matt Damon's is going to fall and fall and fall. I think they're going to have a from scene. a sheer talent point of view. I actually, that's not how it started. I think to Matt Damon's a better actor than Ben Affleck. So like, I don't I think did, Ben Affleck's a bit, like, I don't, he should not, like, was he nominated for an Oscar for, um, what's the movie he just made that just won? Where they're all, Argo? A, Argo. He did what? Yeah. He did did he get nominated? Won. He did not deserve to be nominated. Like, I just, I, no, he was not amazing in that movie. One director. One director. And picture. Actually, ah, uh, yeah, you're, maybe you're, I, what has Matt Damon done in the last, like, The Martian was the last one that he was really, really, yeah, I thought about? The Martian was, like, I thought he was awesome in that movie. 
He it, that was a, that was a great movie, and yep. he was great for it. He was it. great in that movie. It was almost like yeah, and I think it, he was meant for it. Yeah, like, exactly. he was meant for it. Yeah, exactly. That's a good one though, because um, Matt Damon is kind of he had his little thing in Thor Ragnarok, which I adored to, oh, to no right. end. I thought that was the best thing ever, where he was and he was Loki, which I thought was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. He did downsizing, which I don't think did very well. No. Um, and I didn't. I didn't actually see it. It looked interesting. I, I was actually it. interested in watching it, but I didn't end up seeing it. But I think once Affleck gets, I think Affleck just needs to get out of the DC world. He's been bogged down with too much Batman controversy. Is he? Oh. Isn't he? All of that stuff. And then once he gets back to knowing what he, what, doing what he can do, which is he is a good actor, he's a great writer, and he's a great director. Great director. And I think all of those. But I don't think in the like I think writing and directing great. Don't write, direct, and act, but he's done well in all three as well. Right? You, so want, a picture, you want best picture. Like, so I, I am tough to I'm downplaying a guy that I, I have to stress. He is good at what he does and he's yeah. done great things. I just don't think he can act. So, like, at the end of the day, though, like, I'm looking at the last five years and Matt Damon, I don't know if he's in any of my top even 30 movies of the last five years, but like, Ben Affleck is holding Gone Girl, The Accountant, Argo. Like, he is in the game and only growing. The town, gone, and baby, gone. Like, the town. Well, Gone Baby Gone is absolutely amazing. It's, Ed Harris in that movie for me was yeah. just, he's just everything. Like, he's so good in that movie. Ed Harris is one of those guys that people don't remember. You know what I didn't like about Gone Baby Gone? A little spoiler alert. Don't make Morgan Freeman the bad guy. <laughs> don't you dare but at like, the end. But that's why he did it, because it was so heartbreaking that it was Morgan Freeman. I know, Freeman. And, and like, for the right did. reasons. Uh, but but you, you can't, uh, sorry, I gotta get rid of this bug. The, uh, that was, it was so <laughs> great. <laughs> it was like... You felt like Casey Affleck's pain. You're like, yeah, I yeah, get yeah. why you're doing it. It's like, but I he should have done. I think Matt Damon will remain Matt Damon as he is now for a very long time yeah. until he gets to that point where he makes that one movie that ends up putting him, you know, up top. I like to call like, that the Bill Murray, the Bill Murray way. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, uh, he'll pop in here and there. He'll do what he needs to do. I honestly think that Ben Affleck will hit a stride on the directing. I think he's going to Matt start Damon will. Uh, no, ben, ben, ben Affleck. Affleck, ben, yeah. Affleck sorry. ben Affleck will end up going up, and yep. he will. I think he'll focus more on his directing and his writing, which yeah. I hope he does. Yeah. And who knows? In ten years, we could be having that conversation while Nolan is still crushing it. And he'll be like a Scorsese, where he's been doing this for however many years before he actually gets a statue. Before he actually gets a statue, and uh, he might have one that like Scorsese did for Departed, which I'd still say, yeah, sure, give him the thing for Departed, but you should have gotten it for. Many other films before that, right? Like the up and comers that are going to take over the world: Jake Gyllenhaal, Ryan Gosling. In terms of acting, right? In, yes, sorry, I'm not talking about producing uh, or, or anything else. Like I'm well, talking the new, about the new age of directors is already here. Yeah, like Guillermo del Toro. I know he's not new, but not like he's starting but to get his love now. He's getting back into it, especially yeah. with Shape of Water. That in your Jake Gosling. Gyllenhaal, though. Come on, let's. Wrong. For Nightcrawler, the fact that he never got nominated for Who's was nominated robbed. that year? Robbed. I don't remember. I don't Was care. that the year that they gave Leo his, just said, like, this is your movie, like, here you go? Is that the Maybe. year? Maybe. And I don't mind I that. he was awesome at Nightcrawler. I, was so I, I don't mind the fact that he got that for the Revenant and well, the Dog of Body and that. But I, I, Jake Gyllenhaal got robbed, so I'm with yeah. you 100%. I, I think he is He's one he of the most versatile in the game. Well, it's just like he doesn't do bad movies. I think there's one called Rendition, I think, that is just okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, uh, what, Code. What was Source, Source code. code? Like, so Bro. good. So underrated. But, like, it's that, that's, so that's, good. That's when you know an actor's good, when he does so many good movies that you for, you you haven't even watched all their good movies. Like, so that was me and Denzel eight years ago. I was like, whoa, Deja Vu? Well, where did this come from? Oh, this is amazing. He's so <laughs> under the radar, too, and then he comes in and hits. But Nightcrawler, for me, is probably my favorite thing he's ever done. Yeah. That movie was just bonkers yeah. crazy. I, and his I, transformation in that was just it, incredible. It surprised me, like, how good that movie was. It, and it was that good because of him. I, I totally agree. You know that in that movie, and maybe you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but is there a, is there a character that you fall in love with in Nightcrawler? Only his driver. But see, do you? Because he's absolutely, he's got the intelligence of like, I, I was going to say, he is the only exception. Only but at the end of the, the day, end. he's, yeah. That's but even end. during the movie, you're like, this guy's so unintelligent. I can't, yeah, he's I not know. endearing to me. I'm not sure if it was you, Jim, or you, G, that talked, we talked about this. And it was like, it's funny because like, 
his character is technically the protagonist, but he's actually the antagonist. 100%. He's the antagonist. Even, the uh, d- well, who's the journalist? Rene uh, Russo. Rene Russo. She, she is like... She's the enabler. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, she's the enabler. her, but you're kind of like, no, 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 you are scum yeah, as dude. the character. And then she she's has... Amazing. And then she has that guy who's like the angel over her shoulder that's always like, this is wrong. We shouldn't be doing that. I don't know the actor's name. But you love him, but then you're like, but you're one of those guys that would have told on us in gym class. So, like, I don't like you either. So, throughout Nightcrawler, there's not a character that you're like, and even um, Bill Paxton, the other, you're like, nah, you're sleazy, man. Like, give me, there's not one character I enjoy. It's funny because I think it's just a movie that craps on the media. And, And I also think it's a movie about villains. Oh yeah, it, it, it could. It doesn't. Maybe it doesn't need the protagonist. It just needs uh, the villain. The protagonist, maybe, is, if you're really like going deep into it, is the public that is eating up this media, yeah. and they're the ones that are going into it. Because Rene Russo didn't turn until he showed up. She was like that before, but she, he ended up pushing her even further. Right, which further. is evident in that last scene when they're when she's like, "This is the greatest thing we've ever seen," or whatever. She now has somebody that justifies her pushing it. Even further. further. Because he'll go there. You might, she, that's exactly right. And you might be right. Like, a movie doesn't always need a good protagonist, but it always needs a good antagonist. It, it, like, needs, it, yeah. it needs a good antagonist because you need somebody to hate. Like, and he, and they it. won. And realistically, the way it ends, the bad guys win. Yeah. yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. But they do. <laughs> but you were going, you said Jake Joe Hall? Uh, Ryan Gosling. I, I just think those two are... But like, they I think are, they're already here. They are here, but I just think that they have not hit full potential. Like I think Jake Gyllenhaal is actually going to be an actor of our time. A hundred percent. By the time he's in his like f- like late forties, we're gonna be like, oh wow, because we saw him come up, yeah. and he is nonstop. His body work already is so good. Like, well, think about think about the people now that are that grew up with Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Now they're looking at him now and like, well, we knew him way back yeah. when. Yeah. So we could have these guys that are now like, they're they're at the top, right? But, you know, you get your big guys like your Clint Eastwood. Me, one of my personal all-time favorites, Paul Newman. Oh, yeah. I adore Paul Newman. I think everything he's ever done yeah. and like the, the Hustler is one of my favorite movies of all time. I was just about to say, The Hustler. I, yeah. Like that, that, and I mean, he was amazing in Color Money. He's been yeah. amazing in everything he does. Butch Cassidy, yeah. all that stuff, right? So, every. All of that, or sorry, not Butch Cassidy. Yeah, Butch Cassidy. Yeah, Butch Cassidy. 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 With Robert. Uh, but I, yeah, I agree with you. I think those are the guys, they're under the radar, and then they're all going to end up being those guys that are going to have a longevity in the game. Well, I, look I at disagree all, on Ryan Gosling. I look at youth. Okay. Um, he's convincing in every one of his roles. Is he? He knows how to play the Hollywood game. See, that's what I think it is. I think Ryan Gosling is just, like, there's... An actor's actor, yep. DDL, actor's actor, right? Like the guy, the guy just knows how to act. Like that's what he does. Like Meryl Streep too. Meryl, Meryl Streep, Streep is just like boom. Tom Hanks. Yep. I think Ryan Gosling is a Hollywood actor, and he's a Hollywood actor because I think a lot of the roles that Ryan Gosling does, he's really good at picking them. He makes sure he picks the right roles. He's really good at that. Yep. Crazy Stupid Love. I couldn't see anybody else doing that except for Ryan Gosling because it is Ryan Gosling. He's Ryan Gosling in that movie, and I think a lot of his movies, he kind of is the same. He's yeah. he's kind of like when he's sad, Ryan Gosling. He's always sad, Ryan Gosling. It's like he's it's the same kind of. I don't think he's very versatile, except for his uh, little stint on Breaker High back in the day. Nah, nah, <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I know Breaker High. Oh, so, uh, I would put Tom Hardy in that list. No, oh, for sure. I would definitely put Tom Hardy. He's I think Tom Hardy uh, again, same kind of thing. Versatility though for Tom. I don't think he's he stretched it as much, but no. I think he picks the right roles, mm-hmm. and whenever. When Tom Hardy said he's going to do the Venom movie, and I'm a huge, again, huge Spider-Man guy. Yeah. I'm so excited for this because he's doing it, <laughs> and that means he believes in the project. He's read the script, and he loves the script. Yeah, fair. So when someone does a movie like at his caliber, and there are those actors that are very selective, you know it's going to be good. I still worry that Marvel's because not they doing can. it. <laughs> I still you worry that what? Marvel's not doing it. Like any, any superhero movie right now that's being made and that Marvel's not making, I worry about it. It's tough. The, they I get mean, it. There's, there's even talks of DC going to Marvel, like the, their characters, like Warner Bros. Draw, like sending them over there. Well, and that's, what Fox over did with, and, that's what Fox did. That's what Fox did. They did, yeah. And they, they've even pushed back two of their other movies. But uh, yeah, actors for you that you think are going to be in that 
The Jake Gyllenhaal one you nailed right on the head. I like JGL, Joseph Gordon Levitt. Uh, JGL's definitely in there as well. Yeah. Um, I think I think we have to talk about a guy like Eddie Redmayne. Um, yeah, he's good. I think he's going to be one of the. Yeah, I think he's going to be like a Daniel Day Lewis. I I think he kind of is already on that path. Yeah. You gonna give me some Cumberbatch over here? Is that oh, what you're going to give me? Cumberbatch is also excellent. The yeah. Brits know how to act. They, like and they, they, they just is amazing. Do. Like <laughs> you name a Brit that's like in the game right now, and they're all really good. Um, we're talking about actors. Well, why but, do we? Okay, why do we only look at roles like when a man plays a woman, when a woman plays a lesbian? When someone has to play someone who's handicapped, those like extreme roles when you have to mimic a uh, a biopic character, yeah, yeah. and that's when we give people credit, but we don't give consistency, um, likability, simple things the credit. Like I get it, Redmayne played a woman, or is that what he did? Well, he, he was uh, he, in the played, Danish girl he won he for was... did he win for the Danish girl or did he win for Theory of Everything? I'm pretty sure he won for Theory of Everything. I think it was Theory of Everything that he won for. And I know what you're saying. It's almost like... um, Well, I think it's partly... I think it's harder to act like somebody or take something on than it is to create your own. Is it? I think so. It's harder to act like someone else than to create your own. I think so. Because people are going to critique you more on acting like somebody than they are somebody you created. I put Christian Bale in that role. Uh, one of my favorite. Oh, he, role, I think he's already there. Yeah, my, I think my favorite here. movie. Uh, one of my favorite roles he's ever done is in the Fighter. Hundred percent. I adore the Fighter. Um, I love Rocky One. I love Creed, but something about the Fighter, and that was my favorite role for Mark Wahlberg too. But in terms of Christian Bale, I look at it where what he had to do in that and the behind the scenes stuff, where you know the real life sisters couldn't tell the difference yeah. between their actual brother and Christian yeah. Bale. Yeah. I think it's very difficult to do it and not do it in a caricature way and not do and do it in a way that yeah. uh, is real. There are some people that do, you know, certain roles that they kind of go over the top and it's almost insulting. Yep. And there's a very fine line when it comes to that. 100%. But, I mean, at the same time, you, you look at some Oscar bait movies, they play on those tropes, Yeah. I think. And I think, like, people who, I think for, like, winning, it's just, like, like we were talking about in our group chat, like the NBA MVP chat. It's like, it's not about actually who is the best. A lot of it has to do with narrative. Like, yeah. that's what it is, right? It's it's like, that's why... Christian Bale is there, though. Like, I think that's a great call. But I would almost put him, like, I'm looking for young up-and-comers that will be the future Christian Bales. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, because he was there. And he's been around for a long time. You could put Michael Fassbender in that list. Too. Oh, I, yeah. He's... I love Michael Fassbender. He's there, he's there too. Have you ever seen um, Frank? I have. I love that movie. It's a good movie, yeah. Oh, take a look at it. The I don't understand how he did it, but the fact that he was able to emote with it's this weird. giant head, it's weird. It's so weird. Yeah. Like, that's the only way you can put it. And he emotes through it. There's no face, anything. Yeah. It's, it's a fun and, movie. And, and everybody around him, and then just the way that it ends, and it, it's it's definitely worth checking out. It is worth checking out. It's a fun movie. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking. Gentlemen, closing arguments, closing... Closing topics. Well, okay. we're, where are we? We're at an hour fifteen. We can like in. Denzel Washington's the goat. Which was? He's he DDL is the goat. DDL. I think I think he doesn't okay. have a repertoire that is big enough for me to say oh, for pound. Yeah. With, like roles per Oscar. If yeah, you like, put it that way, it's really tough to to consider. I that should have to goal. name Gangs of New York, which he got snubbed. And he should have won for that movie. I. Him as Butcher Bill is truly the defining moment of me where I was like, this is active. Like, I actually liked his uh, Bill the Butcher than I did, or Butcher Bill than I did uh, his role in There Will Be Blood. Oh, 100%. I feel, oh, yeah. I feel There Will Be Blood is a little overrated. Oh, I still consider it. I, it's, uh, I, I still think it's a great movie, but yeah. I still think it's a little bit overrated because a lot of, like, there is a, there's a great story and everything, but it really doesn't come to a head until that milkshake moment. Yeah, and that's where everything kind of comes to it. And I understand the battle back and forth. <laughs> All the acting is great across the board. The opening for that is the first is twenty amazing. minutes. There's no dialogue. It's a but it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. so powerful. Yeah, he was is. able to do that. But it's Bill the Butcher. Daniel Day oh. is so predictable for you to say. <laughs> of course, he's it's a stage actor. But like, he's okay. it's because it's the truth. What do you want me to do? It's, you want it's, me to lie? It's tough to argue yeah. that. It's like if you're talking sports and you bring up like Tom Brady. It's like. Check the ring. You know, you're talking to Michael yeah, Jordan where he's like holding like 
a handful of rings kind of thing. Like it's like I, I'm I'm hanging out with Denzel all day. If I'm doing a movie, I'm picking Denzel over can, Daniel Day. I, I, okay. There's no shade on Denzel. I love me some Denzel. Okay, hold on. If you go. if Denzel opens a movie and Daniel Day open a movie same weekend, which one are you going? I'm for? going to Denzel. I'm going to Denzel too. So that's a. That's, what are we talking about here? I can watch a DDL movie at home. I'd actually prefer to watch a DDL movie at home in the, on my couch, do my thing, got some food, yeah. and I'm watching it. Because DDL, it's just you and it's that. not flashy. It's like you're making a connection. Yeah. Whereas like a Denzel movie, it's like I'm. Pro- I might be on a fucking train. Oh, sorry. No. I might be on a train and he's on top of it and I'm watching him try to save it. Like and yeah, he I does it better than anybody. <laughs> and I want to see that in theaters. I get Unstoppable. that. Unstoppable. I'm not saying just I don't like, like his movies. I'm just saying DDL is the goat. I will. Uh, yeah, and and it's Check that's, the that's a t- that's a tough thing. That's a big thing to talk about, right? Because I would go to Denzel. Yeah. And to my dying day, I I think I I don't think there's a Denzel movie that I don't like or a role that I don't like. No. I will still always take Training Day as his, as his best role. That's his and best his, role, hey. His for me, he he's done phenomenal stuff. But I I don't know if it was a combination of when Training Day hit for me mm-hmm. and seeing Denzel like not, being a bad guy, not Malcolm X. Yeah, you know, like not not his preview, like not being Daniel, like him, like not from Philadelphia, yeah. not all that those roles and stuff, not John Q, yeah. all that stuff. And his Alonzo is just. It's amazing. There, there is something there on almost a Heath Ledger Joker. Yeah, it's like thing. The guy that's always yeah, it was simplistic. It, that's the beauty of it. He's always been a good guy, and like when he went bad, like nobody did Maybe bad. That's her, and the way he was. did it too, like he's been doing it forever. It's <laughs> yeah. almost like he's been fooling everybody, playing the nice guy, and he's he's been this guy his entire yeah. life, right? Which obviously isn't the case. And 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 just that, like it's and it's those nuances in it too. It's the the eyes, the it's laughs, the, like, his laugh, yeah. the way he's like when he was sitting there when the the tra- that first transaction's going, and he's just like, <laughs> like those little those little nuances yeah. and stuff, and no one in the world, that's Denzel, that's Denzel, and no one in the world can say you're in the office, baby, flip the switch, still Dre going, and the and right off like he could. Yeah. With the way I look at any movie that is brilliantly played by a great actor is if you replace that actor with somebody else, yeah. could yeah. could it have worked? That's a, that's, and that's the that is way. such a great example of you can't take Denzel out of Training Day, and that movie is significantly worse because of that. Yeah. You can't get to buy the numbers. Yeah, right? you say that about DDL too, though. Yeah, that, well, for sure. You could. nobody could do those roles the way. Yeah, you could do definitely. Roles. Uh, Streep is the same thing. I th- I would say Fastbender as well yep. is on there. Jill and Hall as well, and I think because they're so different. Like when you see Fastbender, you see Fastbender. Yeah, he's so like he, he he's so recognizable. He's, he he doesn't get lost in a crowd, and these actors carry a presence that doesn't get lost. Right, the like, gravitas. Who's saying that, that's it? Gravitas, yeah. Gravitas. I use that a lot, <laughs> but yeah, they have that, and and that that's your point, right? Like. You take somebody out of it, can they do the same thing? Can can that movie just keep, keep going? Some right? people carry movies, and, and that's the thing. well. That was the argument against Leonardo DiCaprio for years. It's yeah. like, yeah, he he deserves an Oscar because he always plays great roles. Yeah. But there's not many roles where I believe you couldn't replace him with someone. Back I, and I think the I, you know what, and I'll agree with a lot of those movies, except for The Aviator, because yeah. I think he played that role like nobody could have. Like he just yeah. nails that role. He should have won. That. He's amazing. Yeah. He should have won. That. There is going to come a time where we look at Ca- DiCaprio and go, "He may be the goat." <laughs> I'm telling you right yeah. now, I, he I, may be the goat, depending on what he does in the second half of his life. Yeah, it depends on what he does from here on out. But and that's a, and I, and I think he's going to be one of those again selective guys. He will be in that. There are the actors that we see all the time, and then there's going to be these guys. Oh yeah, he's there already. I like there, there, Leo's there. Uh, yeah, there, and there, he learned that early oh. in his career very important thing especially when you pick the right scripts with the right directors that's what brings it out well, he's the to best be actor. at his age to work for a James Cameron which we never really talked about James Cameron in the upper oh we should but, have but Spielberg Cameron we could go we, we could go, go for days right days. on it um, but <laughs> but hitting that early with that type of director and bringing that out of him and an actress like Kate Winslet who I also put in the Meryl Streep she's there the baby. life of Dave like, Gale there baby, baby. I, I put her I put her up she's there she's like She's pretty close to my favorite actress. Like yeah. I love her. I and the, and the only thing out of uh, 
uh, I know I don't know if we're gonna have time to touch on it this time, but we will the next time. Jobs. Kate Winslet is the only person that could outdo a fast bender in a scene. Oh, she is amazing. I don't know if she did outdo him because when I look at that, it's fast bender is incredible. He's so good. and that movie is incredible. But Winslet, she's, right to his face. Well, she's never bad. Like I like she's the the movie The Reader. You ever seen the movie The Reader? Yeah. This is what she won her first off her first and only Oscar for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is just. It's she's just excellent. Like she just lives those roles, like her, everything from her body to it's just she's yeah. the best. And, she's and when you and when you look at those actresses that are gonna get there, I don't see a Jennifer Lawrence getting there. I honestly don't. I don't. Um, I think her roles are very specific. Like yeah, she's a great I, actress for a specific role, for specific stuff. I will always defend her in um, Silver Lining. Love that she's movie. In that she's movie. incredible in yeah. that. All that stuff. Um, but yeah, Kate Winslet is in that. Yeah, she's gonna be our. She's gonna be our next. Uh, like Helen Mirren. Uh, our next uh, Meryl Streep, yeah. Dame Judi Gen- du- Judy Dench, Dame, like Dame, 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 Dame Isn't it Dame Helen Mirren? No. Dame Helen Mirren too, like all uh, like for for female actresses. Yeah. Kate Blanchett's already there. Oh, she's she's, she's, she's a top above. Well. She's above Kate yeah. Winslet, and I Kate would, Winslet's getting so to Kate Blanchett's. Role, I would say like, so too. She just Nicole. Yeah. You put Nicole Kidman in Nicole there. Nicole Kidman's could, up there. Yeah. We didn't talk about up and coming like young actresses. We will. We'll we will. For sure. Gentlemen, thank you so much for thank being here. Thank you. This was fun. This on, is... on episode two of Jim, G, and H, yeah. uh, the F word, we will be discussing the difference between jobs, the social network, and the founder. Because oh. I love... That's happening. Like biopics, yeah. Biopics. That's and a good specifically idea. Those, that up, yeah. Specifically those three, yeah. I think would be awesome. But yeah, Jim, Hennick, you guys are awesome. Thank Thanks you Thanks so much. much. This is going to be a, a recurring thing. Um, again, you can find this. I mean, you already listened to it, but we'll put it on uh, the Entertain Facts page on Instagram. You can follow me on Twitter at the upwards G. Uh, gentlemen, anything that you can plug for any whatever whatever you have going on that you can that you want to. You I'm, know what? Just this is going out to like want, wherever, so who knows? I guess if you listen to this, I want you to have a hot bath tonight. I want you to get into comfortable pajamas. I want you to get under a blanket, and I want you to watch Inception and really absorb that in. Wow. Final final comments, Hennick. Um, Interstellar is the greatest movie ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, Hennick, and G, and we're out.